he died. He died for everybody. Everybody. So isn't that universal salvation? Isn't everybody saying that? Muslims? Are you listening to this? He died for you. Mm. Everybody listening here, he died for you. I don't think that's the New Testament gospel. To look at a person, like I pick I want to use on the front row here, I don't need from Adam and walk up to you and say, Christ died for you. I don't think that's the New Testament gospel. Because he is the only prophet that who is worshipped by the human being as a God. I'm still speaking. That's why. Did Muhammad suffer for you? No, he does not suffer for you. Jesus suffered for you. He has nails on his hands. Why? Because he wants to bring you peace to God. He wants to bring you peace to God. Can we do with this passage, please? Well, if you if you use the standard, well, you should believe in Jesus because he did a wonderful thing for you by dying for you, which the apostles never stated. Uh, then you'd have a problem. But if you preach the biblical gospel of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that everyone is to submit to his lordship, uh, you don't need to know who the elect are or, or any of those things. That God in eternity past chose to save his elect people out of pure grace, pure love, They're un it was undeserved, and therefore made perfect provision for them. What was the intention of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Christ going to the cross? What did God intend to accomplish? I believe that we have to approach this subject from the God word side. That is, what was God's intention? What does God's word say about this? And does the Bible tell us what the intention of the triune God was? When Jesus went to the cross, did he go there specifically with each and every person in mind? We have some beautiful hymns that talk about my name was written upon his hand. Well, can the person who is going to spend eternity separated from God say my name was written upon his hand and I frustrated his purpose? Or when Paul says I have been crucified with Christ, is there something special about that? And what is the effect of Christ's substitutionary death. If it is made in behalf of people, then does that make them savable? Or does it actually bring about their salvation? Or does it, is it just a part of what will eventually bring about their salvation, given the fulfillment of either a long or short list of other things? I would like to suggest, and I would like to prove from the text of Scripture, that Jesus' death upon the cross was a covenantal death. God deals with his people in the form of covenants. And the new covenant was established in the blood of Jesus Christ. It was a new covenant death. And I would like to establish the fact that that has a specific audience and a specific perfecting effect for those for whom it is made. That specifically, Jesus Christ died in behalf of his elect people and that in so doing, he procured eternal redemption in their place. And I'd like to just look at one particular text of scripture sort of as a focus uh, that we can look at all the universal texts and specific texts in light of just this one text. Uh, Roman, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 says, For this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant. There's the new covenant language. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called, very key uh, text there, very key word, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. There is a specific purpose in Jesus' death, and that is so that those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. There the intention of what Jesus was doing upon the cross is revealed to us. If you understand the holiness of God, and if you understand the sinfulness of man, if, if your mind is in fact not just a, if you're not just a secularist with a little bit of Christian peanut butter on top, but if you really want the Word of God to form your worldview and the way you think, then you look at what happens in the Old Testament and even if you continue to struggle with some things, one thing becomes very, very clear is that God is holy and he has wrath against sin. 
and you learn that if we take sin far too lightly, we countenance it far too easily, and we are really trying to edit God into something more comfortable, we don't realize that he has the right to bring his wrath to bear against any sinner at any time and in any way he pleases. Now, most Christians I know will say, oh, sure, God would have the right to destroy any rebel sinner at any point in time. Then when God does it, they get really upset. So it's one thing to say, it's another thing to actually believe it. And if what amazes you about Romans 9, 13 is Esau, I hate it. May I suggest that you completely miss what's amazing about that verse. What's amazing about that verse is Jacob, I love. Now, if you have the idea of God as the grandfather in the sky who looks like Colonel Sanders, <laughs> um, who is just like the indulgent grandparent, uh, who never disciplines, has no concern for his own glory, and is just nothing but a big marshmallow guy of love. No holiness, nothing like that, no justice, just, just love. God is love, but that's not all he is. If that's your view of God, then this, does, this text, all you're going to go with, I, I just reject that God could ever hate anyone. But what should amaze you is if you know something about Jacob, I don't know about you, I read that story. Esau's a dude. I mean, he's cool. I mean, you know, he's got he's got his 338 wind mag and he's out uh, he's out taking game and, and he you know he rides around his his uh, four by and uh, you know he's probably a star of the basketball team, football team, baseball team. He might even play soccer. I mean, this guy is just incredibly multi-talented, and he's buff, and he's big, and Jacob seems to be an accountant. Sorry if there's any accountant. I was going to say attorney, I just don't want to get sued, so. You know, he's the pasty white guy, he never just goes outside the tent, he's got allergies, and he wears glasses. I mean, seriously. He, he just, and, and he's deceptive. And he's, he's sneaky, and he's just not the kind of guy that, you, that we all go, yay, Jacob versus Esau. We, we sort of want the Esau thing, you know? <coughs> and God says, no. No, that's not what I'm going to do. The promise goes to Jacob. The promise goes to Jacob. It's not based on what they did. That's what the whole point is. It's not of works, but of him who called. It's not because they had done anything, even before they were born. God had said, this is what's going to happen. This is how I am going to accomplish my purpose. He died. He died for everybody. Everybody. So isn't that universal salvation? Isn't everybody saying that? Muslims, are you listening to this? He died for you. Mm. Everybody listening here, he died for. I don't think that's the New Testament gospel. I don't think that's the New Testament gospel. To look at a person, like I pick out one of you on the front row here, I don't need from Adam and walk up to you and say, Christ died for you. I don't think that's the New Testament gospel. 